Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Experience Maker Live Show. My name is Dan Gingis. I'm a customer experience keynote speaker and coach, and I'm here with you every week as we dive into different aspects of customer experience with some of the best experts out there. Before we begin, I just want to remind people that I have a new book out called The Experience Maker as well, How to Create Remarkable Experiences that Your Customers Can't Wait to Share. And I am so excited to announce that Book Authority named it one of the best customer experience and best customer service books of all time. That's a long time, all time. So I uh, was very happy to make both of those lists. Check out the Experience Maker, and it makes a great gift for your employees as well. Also, I don't know if you know, but I co-host a podcast with my buddy Joey Coleman. It's called The Experience This Show. We've been doing it for 165 episodes and we have so much fun each week. We tell three different customer experience stories um, and takeaways. It is a lot of fun. It is available on your favorite podcast app, or you can even ask your friend Alexa to play the experience this show, and she will bring you immediately to our most recent episode. All right. Well, today, speaking of episodes, I am very excited to introduce you to today's guest. I got to meet him on a webinar that I just kind of randomly got assigned with him and uh, we met and realized we had a lot in common. So I definitely wanted to have him on the show. He's a former chief marketing officer of Shopify and Shutterstock. And right now he's an operating partner at the largest consumer focused private equity firm. His name is Jeff Wazer. How are you doing, man? I'm really good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Hey, I am doing great as well. Um, and I'm super excited to talk to you. You and I had a lot of fun uh, doing a webinar previously. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just meet somebody and you realize you could probably talk for a while. So, hey, we got a half an hour. And uh, even though it always goes by really fast, uh, I think that we'll, uh, we'll get a lot in here today. Uh, so why don't we just start by, if you could uh, introduce yourself a little bit and, uh, and tell us a bit more about your very interesting background and what you're up to now. Sure. Um, you know, and you gave sort of the high level sketch, uh, but to go a notch deeper, as you say, I was chief marketing officer of Shopify from 2018 to 2020, which is when, you know, the, the company really went through its uh, big growth spurt from about 700 million in revenue to 3 billion in revenue. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're super proud of that. Before that, I was chief marketing officer of Shutterstock. As you said, I think the thing that's probably less obvious uh, on the surface of my resume is that my background was really in analytics. Um, and as you know, beginning about a decade ago, all the marketing dollars started to leave, you know, broad based offline unaddressable channels and flow into more measurable digital channels. And that was really when analytics work and marketing work started to fuse um, because marketing became much easier to quantitatively optimize. And so, um, you know, after solving some uh, marketing optimization problems from within the quant seat, one thing led to another. And I accidentally found myself managing people's brand architecture and creative execution. And, um, you know, that was certainly a, um, a mental shift for me, but, but um, gave me a new appreciation for sure of how the qualitative and quantitative sides of marketing need to work in concert uh, to really create great results. Yeah, it's awesome. You get to use both sides of your brain, in other words, which is always yeah. fun. So you then went into private equity. Why that move? Yeah, um, you know, I, I wanted to do something different. Um, it was uh, awesome, but also sort of backbreaking to play what I thought of as a bit of catch up in marketing for tech organizations that typically started with a lot more sophistication in product and engineering than they had in the commercial disciplines. And so, you know, both Shutterstock and Shopify, we were trying to keep up with a fast pace of growth while also sort of closing what I think of as a sophistication gap with our peer uh, departments. And so that was wonderful, um, but it was also time to take a break from that. And, uh, you know, what's so great about private equity is that you are working with a portfolio of companies, um, you know, all of whom have needs in your discipline. And so, you know, figuring out how to do the critical few things that can drive a company to grow and deliver the private equity firm's value creation thesis, while also being able to do that at scale across many companies and funds um, is certainly part of the challenge. I'll also say for me personally, you know, I'd always been on one side of the table with the operators and switching to the investor 
and sponsor side of the table was fascinating because I got to start to learn the art of investing by watching sort of the intellectual tete-a-tete among some of the world's best investors that we have at El Catterton. And so um, just you know, being on the steep part of a learning curve for something new is always, you know, intellectually stimulating. For sure. So how much does your marketing and analytics background then play a role in what you do today? It plays a huge role in, in I think, probably two main ways. One is just that, as we discussed, marketing has become a analytical discipline per se. And so, you know, driving results within our portfolio companies requires using those quantitative marketing approaches. But I think the other one is that the operations folks in a private equity firm are all often a go between between executives in the portfolio companies and investors on deal teams. And I think I'm, I'm probably in a better position to understand the investing side of the house and the modeling that underpins an investment um, because I have a background in analytics. And so, you know, if nothing else, uh, I think it helped me get up to speed a little bit faster on the deal side dynamics. All right, well, as you know, this is a show about customer experience. And one of the things that I've been dying to ask you is when a private equity company is looking either to invest or to grow its portfolio, what role does customer experience play? Is it something that you're actively looking at? Absolutely. You know, the, the the broadest question any investing firm would ask before deploying capital is what can we do as a partner, you know, to help this company perform better? And in order to answer that question, you, of course, need to benchmark what their starting point is. Now, you mentioned this at the top of the show, Al Catterton is a consumer focused private equity firm. And so one of the key benchmarks for anyone investing in the consumer space that helps you gauge the starting point from which you want to create new value is to understand how customers are experiencing the product, service, or business. And so, you know, that means understanding not only some of the metrics-based uh, ways of gauging customer experience like net promoter score or brand awareness funnels and the like, but also how that experience is being created uh, through um, activities in the different channels. So like if you have for example, a company whose go-to-market is primarily digital, understanding the experience that the company is creating on Facebook and Instagram might be a core component of benchmarking what you can do to help them improve. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, sitting at the intersection of marketing and customer experience for a long time, and I'm a believer that those also, like you said with analytics, that those are starting to meld into one, in part because really what marketing has become today is the promiser of experience. You know, if you look at kind of the best marketing, best Super Bowl ads, best uh, digital ads, they're basically talking about here's what it's going to feel like to mm -hmm. use our product or to ha use our service, how to, to drive our car or to drink our soda or whatever it's going to be. There's this idea of we're going to tell you how it's going to feel. And yeah. that to me is really is, is talking about the experience. Um, I've also can, I just, can I just jump in there with yeah, sure. I think I think that's a really smart way of articulating it because um, there's a tendency to uh, speak about products or services in terms of functional benefits. But of course, where we really succeed as marketers and experience professionals is when we tap into deeper emotional needs and wants. Um, and so when you talk about how something feels, that's awfully different uh, from talking about what it does. But it's a more important equity that you can invest in a brand or experience um, and, you know, would, would um, in the sort of cliched terms of benefits, not features, uh, drive a better result. Yeah, and I think part of that is because so much has become commoditized that if all you're talking about are the features, tomorrow someone else is going to be talking about a product likely that's pretty darn similar. And so it's very difficult to continue competing on that. In some cases, certainly you can. There are de definitely unique products on the marketplace. But to me, that experience is really the part that isn't copyable, that, that is sort of the ultimate differentiation. Um, and that often drives, you know, not only purchase behavior, but it, then it drives, you know, continued usage, recommendations, referrals, that sort of thing as well. Yeah, 100%. Um, when I think about the companies that have reached... Um, some level of success and then sort of a plateau from which they can't escape. And then the ones that reach, you know, true exit velocity, it's often that difference between, you know, did we have a functional innovation and benefit 
or did we, you know, create brand affiliation that drives, as you say, repeat purchase advocacy, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. So I know you can't talk specifics and that's totally fine, but broadly speaking, what is it that you're looking for right now? If you were looking for um, a new investment, what are, where are the, where are the places that you're digging? Is it all technology and all like digital first companies or um, are there some old school things that are coming back? Just broadly speaking, what's yeah, what yeah. right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I sort of answer the the question from a the, the, the sort of the broader lens of what an investing firm uh, would do as opposed to my own, um, you know, because there, because it's, it's different and different folks take different approaches. But I think that um, it really starts with having a thesis in your area. So, for example, if you believe that there will be, you know, new tools for SMBs, you know, small and medium businesses um, to achieve the professionalization that used to only be available to large enterprise, you know, that would be the kind of thesis you might invest behind if you were a tech investor or a B2B investor. Now, that's not what you know, we foundationally do at El Catterton, um, but it's an example of where you think you have a thesis. And importantly, you think you have a thesis that other people don't also have, because without asymmetric knowledge, you get market pricing. And, you know, if you believe in efficient markets, you won't create disproportionate value. Um, but I think really the important thing is not that the company offer any particular product or be in any particular channel with any particular go to market. It's really that you feel you have a differentiated thought on where something is going and or, and ideally it's an and, uh, an ability to accelerate that particular asset's uh, growth to get there. And that's what makes you, a, you know, a better partner and not just a check. Sure. So you mentioned, um, you, you briefly mentioned this before. I'm interested to know when you look at an entire portfolio, how much overlap is there in terms of the things that you're doing or the um, the activities that you're doing? What, how much of it is scalable across companies versus we really have to focus on each of our babies individually because they're each they're each unique? Yeah, it's that's such a great question. Um, you know, I think uh, that there are some things you can do at the platform level, whether it's, you know, here's a conceptual way to think about optimizing the following channels, or, you know, here's a particular framework, scorecard, you know, analytical dashboard that's reusable. Um, but there's always going to be an element of specificity for how you implement it. One thing I, one thing I tell folks is that if you could just um, make everything, you know, sort of a checklist at the platform level, you wouldn't need experienced operators to do the job. Um, and so I, I always think that it's a, it's a combination of building platform level tools that create, you know, efficiencies because they have scale and reusability, but putting them in the hands of folks who are experienced and can apply judgment and how to deploy them. You can't really succeed with one, um, you know, and not the other. So obviously we've been in some crazy times the last couple of years. And although it seems like hopefully the, the worst the pandemic is behind us, there's still a lot going on that is really out of companies' control. I mean, just this week, uh, a judge overruled the, the national mask mandate. Uh, and so literally mid-flight, customers are being told they can take off their masks. And yet now the government is appealing it. And so who knows, it could be back next week. How do you manage just this constant? We, we change management has been around for a long time, but today it's almost like a you know what's going to happen today, right? A war breaks out, we've got a pandemic, elections. There's all this stuff going on. How do you sort of um, keep an eye on all of that and then react quickly when necessary? Yeah, you know, I, I, it puts me in mind of the the adage that when the tide goes in, you see who's not wearing shorts. Um, and I think that with the uh, onset of COVID. Yes, there were specific things companies needed to do, like figure out a digital offering if they were mostly an in-person business. But there were also procedural things companies needed to figure out, like how to be nimble if they weren't. And, you know, in the adage, we really saw who wasn't wearing shorts. And so, um, you know, we were in a new world, as you say, where, um, you know, um, adaptability is, is a key to success. And um, my hope is that folks didn't only build the specific reactivity that was needed to COVID when it started, you know, over two years ago, um, but also built uh, processes by which they could become nimble because, 
you know, not only do we not know what will happen with COVID, we don't know what the next, you know, major sea change, uh, you know, in business will be. Well, and that sort of brings me to business continuity, which for a while was this, you know, department, kind of like the audit department that like, oh boy, the business continuity people are here, right? You know, and and we don't want to see them because we're going to talk about all of these uh, hypothetical situations that are never going to happen. And I would add pandemic was always one of them. Um, are you seeing sort of broadly uh, more importance placed on um, business continuity planning? And so that, as you say, we don't know what's next. We just have to be prepared for whatever it is. Yeah, I think the answer is some, but probably not enough. It reminds me of the, you know, the 2007 financial crisis, um, you know, where there was a, a wave of regulation that was going to prevent banks from being too big to fail again. And if we're realistic about it, they probably are, you know, still um, where they got back there pretty quickly um, because people have short attention spans and short memories. And, you know, um, you know, we tend to think of uh, these events as black swans that won't repeat themselves. So, you know, I probably I wish there was more of that, um, but, you know, highly company specific. And the answer is probably kind of sort of, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think what what was so amazing in the worst of the pandemic was how certain businesses literally just got brought down to zero. Like the doors are closed. Like we can't open our store today or, or whatever. And man, I don't think any BCP business continuity plan, you know, had that in mind. Right. And so now you sort of have to ask yourself, I believe, you know, if you're a digital or organization, well, what happens if the internet is down? And we can't and we can't be live for a few days, a few weeks. I mean, sounds preposterous, but I don't know. I suppose the internet could go down. Um, what if um, you know? What if we're unable to talk to our employees or to communicate with our employees because all the cell towers are down? Like those kinds of questions, which used to be, like I said, preposterous. It seems to me like smart companies have got to be asking themselves, what do we do? It's like, it's like having the backup generator at your house, right? You've got to, you may never use it, but man, the time the power goes out, you're certainly glad you had it. Yeah. I, you know, and, and I always think that, that perhaps I'm not imaginative enough, but it's hard for me to even think of those kinds of scenarios to the extent that they haven't happened you know and of course the probability of some black swan event is actually probably pretty high the probability of any given black swan event is, is probably pretty low uh, you know it puts me in mind of something that uh the ceo of, of shopify you know toby luca used to say which i thought was very smart which was that it's not that it's important that we're prepared for every eventuality that could possibly happen. That would almost by definition mean that we overinvested in eventualities that will not happen. It's that yeah. we're set up to react quickly when something does, you know, and that's why I sort of went to the procedural point uh, when you asked about COVID adaptation, um, because, you know, any one of those uh, uh, events that you mentioned has an infinitesimally small chance of occurring, but collectively one of them probably will. So then how do you feel in terms of your optimism that, uh, that your portfolio companies are ready for some event going forward? In other words, that the adaptability muscle has been built in the last two years. And so we at least feel optimistic that, hey, come what may, we got this covered. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, it, it's sort of a, an unfair question because I have unbridled enthusiasm for everything we in our portfolio companies do. Um, but, you know, to, if I were to, to try to take a more objective lens to it, I'd say I feel really good because, you know, we feel like we as a platform learned the lesson um, and, you know, made an attempt to, you know, with a fairly broad reach across the portfolio, uh, you know, ensure that we're set up for the next one. So, Again, hard to know what the next one will be, but I think the adaptability lesson was well learned, at least where we stand. Sure. All right, I wanna shift gears for a moment uh, and bring up another term that I believe, I'm, I'm calling it right now, I believe needs to be retired from our nomenclature. Let's do, and that it, right. Term Let's do it right is, now. That term is digital transformation. And the reason why I think it needs to be retired is that if you haven't already transformed to digital, I don't know what the heck you're doing anymore. Like true or false, digital experience and customer experience are basically becoming the exact same thing. A hundred percent true. You know, the reality is that online penetration increases over time. It's a secular shift. It's not going to change. And so the way brands express themselves by now is definitionally digital in most cases, but I'm going to add another reason to retire the term, which is that it lacks specificity. 
you know, if someone says digital transformation, they can mean any number of things. And so, you know, we need to be specific. It's not what you call it. It's what it is, you know? Um, and so when people throw out terms like digital transformation, I'll, I'll ask them like, okay, well, hold on. What change are you actually trying to achieve? And what is the business and customer benefit of making that change? Yeah, it feels like one of those terms where it's like, oh, we got to do digital transformation so we can check that box. And then we'll be done with that. We can move on to something else. And and yeah, I, I don't I think maybe digital evolution I would accept is that, you know, we do think, you know, it, it, it does continue to evolve. We're talking about Web 3.0. This is going to be different than it is today. And so we have to continue growing and evolving, but transforming. I mean, again, the, the idea that was that this was transforming from non-digital to digital. And I think no matter what business you're in, even if your business is mostly physical and in person, you still have a huge digital experience um, that's got to be a part of it. Think of all the fast food restaurants now that have apps where you can order and, and get rewards and all this stuff. So there's a digital component even to the live component. Uh, we have an audience question that I'm going to bring up on the screen for you, Jeff, and I'm going to read it live to you. Uh, when managing a portfolio of companies, how much value in the long run quick fixes bring compared to changing or tweaking the company's culture and frameworks to be more CX oriented and apply those fixes organically? Great question, Yvonne. Thank you. So the quick fix versus the the the, the cultural change. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think in in any scenario, you want to have a balance of you know quick wins and longer term aspirations. So that's sort of a generic overlay that I would give. But one thing I would say in the investing context, and again, this is this is more general to uh, you know um, investing than it is specific to any one firm, is that a quick fix by its definition is not durable. And the way you exit an investment is by selling it to someone else. If it's, the, if it's an IPO, then you're selling it to the public. Sometimes you're selling it to another sponsor. Sometimes you're selling it to a strategic buyer um, that wants to integrate it and create synergies with their current business. But if you have created a quick fix and not a durable change, then they will spot that and it will affect the way they value the business. And so, you know, to maximize the value of a business, any changes you make have to be durable. At the same time, you know, if you spot low hanging fruit and can create quick wins, you want to do that too. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I, I am a believer that by and large customer experience is a series of little things and that those little things add up. And part of the reason I'm a believer in that is that I think too many companies look at CX as being this massive multi-million dollar, multi-year transformational change, and that ends up paralyzing them. And yes, there are some investments that you have to make and and you know some operational things that have to be in place but ultimately it's really about finding all those little spots either to uh, create a great experience where one doesn't exist or to get rid of a bad experience that's that's annoying customers yeah um, i would just jump in with the thought that that they, the two may be related in that seeking out and uh optimizing all the small items may in fact result from creating a culture of seeking them out and optimizing them. So, sure. you know, there, there, there may be um, an element where one drives the other. Yep. All right, one more question from the audience. Uh, Shamil would like to know, is customer experience evaluated during the due diligence phase? Yeah, um, you know, we, we spoke about uh, an element of this a moment ago, which is that, you know, due diligence is all about understanding what the baseline uh, of the company's performance is. So you can make clear statements about how you would create more value as a partner to that company. And so, you know, CX is of course, one of the critical levers for optimization. And so understanding, you know, is this already perfect? I guess that's more of a theoretical construct. I think Dan would probably agree nothing's perfect from a CX perspective, but you know, is it already perfect and not much we can do to create value there? Or are we starting at a low baseline? And if so, you know, is it someplace where we feel like we can collectively, you know, by partnering with the company, create CX upside, or is it stuck where it is for some reason would be an input for how much value we think we can create working together. Cool. Yeah, great answer. Um, all right, just to finish up here, um, what are you excited about for the rest of 2022? It can be in private equity or not, but what are you looking forward to? You know, I'm always looking forward to the next technological innovation. 
you know, whether it's um, figuring out SEO for, um, you know, smart devices like Alexa's and Google Home Hubs or, um, you know, I, I got to have a wonderful experience yesterday. I'm probably late to the game in this um, in a VR world. You know, I had never really spent any time in the metaverse. Um, and so I'm always just curious to see what's going to come next and to separate, you know, we'll look back five years from now and we'll know the answer to a question like, was Web 3.0 all hyper? Was there substance there? And the answer is usually something in between. Um, but I'm just always curious to see how the prognostications uh, that we're making today play out over the longer term. Well, I think the good news is, is that no matter what happens and no matter where we are and no matter how big the metaverse becomes, we're still all going to have customers because without customers, we don't have businesses. And so I at least am confident in predicting that customer experience will continue to be important no matter where it is. Um, Jeff, how can people get a hold of you or Al Catterton? Um, how, how would you like them to connect with you? Yeah, um, you know, we're, we're on LinkedIn. Um, I'd say fire me a note there. Uh, you know, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. And, you know, you know, 95% of the time we'll, we'll connect via email after that. But it's a it's a good place for me to actually get my messages as opposed to, uh, you know, um, I think I've got 20,000 unread messages in Gmail. So um, it's probably the best way to make sure I see it. All right. Mental note, do not ever email <laughs> Jeff to go through LinkedIn. <laughs> as an example. Jeff, I really appreciate you being here today uh, and sharing your wisdom. Uh, you've had such an interesting and dynamic career, and uh, I wish you all the best of luck. Um, they're very lucky to have you, and, uh, and we're lucky to have you on the show. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, and best of luck to you as well. Thank you. And thank you as well for being here uh, each and every week, uh, Thursdays at noon Eastern. Uh, if you have any suggestions on people you'd like to see here on the show, we are booked a couple of months out, but I'm always looking for uh, more dynamic experts like Jeff to be on the show. So uh, just hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter or email and let me know a suggestion. And I'm happy to have them on. For now, I'm Dan Gingas, the Experience Maker, and I will see you next week on the Experience Maker Live show.